Hello, this is Andrew Al from Digital Charlotte, and welcome to the Digital Inclusion Exchange podcast. Today, we'll be listening to the Di- National Digital Inclusion Alliances, also known as the NDIA's Net Inclusion Webinar Series. The National Digital Inclusion Alliance Net Inclusion Conference has been a staple in the digital inclusion community for years, bringing hundreds of practitioners, advocates, academics, internet service providers, and policymakers together to share their knowledge. With social distancing in place, the NDIA is hosting the Net Inclusion 2020 webinar series to replace the conference. This series includes eight one-hour webinars recorded live from September 16th through November 4th. You can find the full schedule, recordings, and resources at digitalinclusion.org slash net inclusion 2020 webinar series. The link to this will be in the description. Today's webinar topic is What Works? New Research About the Effectiveness of Digital Adoption and Skills Intervention Strategies. First recorded on October 14th, 2020. Enjoy. to have in Portland and someday we will go to Portland again. Uh, So until then, we will enjoy our time together here. Uh, I have a fabulous panel with us today. These webinars are being recorded. Uh, The ones previous are already on the website. All of the great links that folks are sharing are also there. Uh, NDIA is a unified voice for digital inclusion programs around the country. Uh, We are both a peer-to-peer network where folks like the ones you're going to talk to now share their lovely skills uh, and we talk to each other and best practices go back and forth. NDIA uses all of that to do the advocacy work that we do um, because it's all based from the knowledge that comes from the ground. So our topic today is information and data. Of course, as with all of these webinars, we're gonna start there and who knows where we go. Uh, We have a plan, but when you're talking to really smart people, you just never never know where it's gonna go. So uh, let's do some introductions. I'm super excited to have Dan Noyes, John Horgan, and Stacey Wedlake with us. I'm gonna have each of them do their hellos. This is who they're with and where they are sitting. They can be as descriptive as they like. Dan Noyes. Thank you. I'm really excited to be here. Uh, I don't know about being so smart, like you said, but I'm excited to be here. Uh, my name is Dan Noyes. I'm the co-CEO of Techos Home. Uh, I've been with Techos Home for about 10 years, and before that, I worked in uh, the Boston school system. Uh, as for where I am sitting, I am in my uh, TV family room, and I have lots of kid art on one side of me. I've got pillows with my children's faces on them on another side of me, so it looks really put together with trees and things behind me, but if you go six inches either way, it's an absolute COVID disaster. So that's me. That is perfect. Thank you. John Horrigan. Hello, everyone. I'm John Horrigan. I'm with the Technology Policy Institute. I've done research for a long time now on who uses broadband, who doesn't, and why not. I worked on that at the National Broadband Plan at the Federal Communications Commission about 10 years ago at the Pew Research Center. And I am sitting in my house in Baltimore, Maryland today. Great, thank you so much. Stacy Wedlake. Hi, um, Stacy Wedlake, uh, pronouns she, her, and I am a research uh, coordinator and analyst um, at the, uh, with the Technology and Social Change Group at the University of Washington Information School and um, I've been uh, a researcher at Tasha for, I think, about six years now. And um, before that, I actually did some digital skills training uh, in uh, a nonprofit and uh, community college and a little and a little bit internationally when I was a Peace Corps volunteer. But um, uh, kind of ha- uh, so it's kind of fun to have both sides of things. And uh, I am sitting in my house in Seattle, Washington. Fabulous. Thank you. All right, let's jump right in. John, you are, without a doubt, uh, I often say, and repeat often, you are the foremost researcher on broadband adoption in the United States. Digital inclusion practitioners use your data and analysis regularly. Your evaluation work on Comcast Internet Essentials came out in the summer of 2019. What did you learn that practitioners should know? What we learned in that study is something practitioners should know about, and I think what practitioners funders should know about, which is that training on digital skills matters. Now, that may seem intuitive to a lot of people listening today, but I've encountered at least the question, 
does it really matter if people get digital skills training? Can't they figure this stuff out on their own? And everybody uh, on this session may know that that's probably not the case, but people do ask that question. And we design that the study in a way to take into account people's prior motivations that they bring to the skills training context. So it could be that highly motivated people seek out digital skills training and that the training itself doesn't really move the dial in terms of their online behavior. We did all sorts of nifty research design and econometric analysis to control for that and found that even independent of people's level of motivations, digital skills training has a significant impact on the likelihood of people using the internet for things like job search or for education. We are definitely seeing right now uh, the awareness that we didn't see before. So folks are figuring out local communities. We're seeing, oh, we need to pay for internet uh, to make sure people have internet. We need to make sure they have devices. That digital literacy part of it sometimes gets pulled into the conversations and sometimes it doesn't. Uh, John, define for us the definitions between uh, broadband availability and broadband adoption. Yeah, that's often conflated in policymakers' mind, at least. So there are two components to the digital divide, um, oftentimes, as I said, conflated among policymakers. One is network availability. Do you, does your house have a wireline broadband connection available to you that you could subscribe to? In the United States, probably something like 90% of all households have at least one wireline broadband option. So network deployment isn't perfect in this country, but about 90% of homes have access to at least one wireline connection. Adoption is the decision to subscribe or not. Or not. And something on the order of 70% of households subscribe to a wireline broadband uh, internet subscription at home. So that 20 percentage point gap is, I think, a good bit of what we're going to be focused on today. What's going on among that 20% of households who don't have a subscription to a wireline broadband option? The research points pretty clearly in some directions. A lot, it's a lot about affordability, but it's also about digital skills. But I think today we're going to be talking a good bit about that 20 percentage point gap and why such a large portion of households in the United States do not subscribe to a wireline subscription. That's perfect. Thank you. Dan. Tech Goes Home, I would say, uh, is the largest place-based digital inclusion organization in the country based upon the number of folks that you serve and your budget. Uh, we all love to learn from you and you, we are very appreciative that you continue to share everything that you learn. Uh, today, can we talk a bit about the data collection strategy that you all have come up with? Uh, and at the last time we were all in person at a net inclusion, you shared with the crowd that you uh, customized a version of Salesforce. Uh, so talk to us about the data you collect and about that Salesforce tool. Yeah, it was, uh, it was a process it's called an instance of Salesforce. I learned, by the way, that's the jargony lingo that I'm um, not paid to use, but I'll use it anyway. The, so the, the impetus for it though was really twofold. One is we'd always done data collection. Uh, but it wasn't done in a way that we were confident we were getting um, the accurate answers we wanted. And so two reasons for this. One, we wanted to know much more specifically who we were serving. And I think, you know, when you're getting into large numbers of people, it's really important to see, you know, what is the household income? What is the educational status? What is the employment status? All of those issues, uh, all of the, the demographic um, pieces, not only for ourselves, but also when we think about growing and you think about funders, uh, these are questions that they will ask is who are you serving? And so I can very clearly tell you right now that 41% of the people we serve have household incomes of under $20,000 a year. I know that 41% of the people we serve are black and 31% are Latinx. Uh, I know that one fourth of the people we serve never, never graduated from high school. And those are really important demographic points for us to know, not only in terms of funding, but also are we reaching the people we want to reach? The second piece of that really is about the impact that we are having. Uh, it's one thing to have the output of here's a computer and here's the internet, like John was saying, but what is the true impact of those skills that you're teaching? So we know that we're helping people find jobs. We know that we're helping people 
<clears throat> their children get better grades. We know we're helping people um, contact their doctors via telemedicine. And those are things we couldn't trace before because it was just too difficult with the amount of data. So we went into a process in 2016 and said, all right, we've got to find a better way of doing this. And we have to do it so we can look at people long term because we wanted to follow up with everyone. So we do a lot of data collection in the beginning during a Tech Goes Home course. But we also do our darndest to follow up with everyone one year later. And we want to connect that data to the person the year before. And that was just impossible before. So we worked with a local um, nonprofit, excuse me, a local company that works specifically with nonprofits setting up data systems. And Salesforce became the best option. There are other ones out there. I'm not, again, I don't work for Salesforce. Please use what you want. But it has been one of the monumental shifts in our program is that any moment I can pull up any piece of data of any course that's run in the last you know, three or four years uh, and really see, for example, we know in 2019 that 500 people who are unemployed coming into our program are now employed because they took Tech Goes Home. And those are some of the data points that we could never have gotten to um, without having a system in place. The last thing I'll say about it, it takes a long time. This is not something you can just turn on. Uh, Salesforce is free itself for nonprofits for a certain number of licenses, but when you get into customization, that takes a lot. So if you're gonna do a full on instance, you need to budget like 50 to $100,000 for something like that. And it took us a year, like a full year of like two, three hours a week, really working with consultants to make it work. Um, this is a process you should go in with your eyes wide open. That's super. Thanks, Dan. Um, so one of the parts that's always seems to to make it more difficult is knowing that your work is what got them the job. Your work is what changed somebody's health. How do you go with that? We've asked very specifically. Like okay. we 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 don't say did you get a job in the last six months? Because we could do that and we could then claim and it would just sort of work. So our questions are actually, we've worked with, this is another thing I would recommend anyone do. Most people, if, at least if you're in an urban environment, you've got universities and colleges in your area who all have data scientists on staff, uh, professors with you know, grad school students who are more than happy to help. Uh, help them, craft, help, they can help you craft the questions. And so we did that. And so the questions really get at, because of Tech Goes Home, because of what you've learned, because I, I'm doing a terrible job of actually saying the questions out loud, which is why I'm not a data scientist. Um, but that, that was important for us too. Like we didn't want, you know, you can never be 100% sure of what the data is gonna tell you, but at the same time, we wanted it to be as honest as possible. And so we ensure that when we ask these questions, follow up, via phone like we actually talk to people we say because of tech goes home did you find that job great thank you stacy you are the opposite of an ivory tower academic digital inclusion practitioners advocates foundations policymakers refer to your work what are you researching now that you think our community will find valuable Sure, thanks. Um, so I'm, I'm a part of Applied Research Center, and so that's kind of what part of what we do is we, you know, we're uh, kind of our goal is to partner with practitioners and produce um, actionable output. So thrilled to hear that that's actually uh, actually happens, um, since that is the goal. Um, so I'm working on a few things, but actually um, is what Dan was just talking about um, is I'm part of doing a a project with the city of Seattle and some uh, local other organizations that are um, doing incorporating some sort of digital skills um, training and basically trying to figure out how to actually measure digital skills acquisition. Um, so kind of a step, not quite this, as far as what Dan was talking about with like, you know, connection to um, outcomes later on, but then actually like, you know, is, you know, what should we kind of be measuring and kind of how to do that. And so um, I kind of partnered with them. Hopefully we'll have something that we can kind of spin out and share with a larger group, but we're going to kind of uh, trial like a set of like 11 kind of foundational like basic skills um, that organizations are going to try to track using like a performance based uh, system so actually saying okay they they sent me an email with the correct subject line check you know sort of thing so 
Um, so kind of stay tuned for that. Um, but something that I uh, recently uh, produced um, that was um, shared, uh, partially shared with the, on the NDA blog was um, with some uh, partners uh, we did uh, a report about uh, refugee women and technology and access education in uh, Seattle and King County. Um, but there's definitely kind of takeaways from that report that kind of apply to broader digital um, inclusion community as well. And one of them is, is um, just really, and I think this is something NDIA knows a lot about, is just really a powerful strategy uh, through partnerships. And, and what really, and one of the things that we saw is, um, you know, so you have all these um, very local community organizations that are working with specific, um, you know, maybe like ethnic communities or neighborhood groups. And, and then like a, an or organization or institution that ha is, um, has more uh, kind of financial or institutional uh, power and partnering with them and building the capacity of, um, of the smaller organization. And, uh, and being able to take advantage of the, the smaller organizations, um, you know, knowledge and expertise with their community. So as an example for a digital literacy class, you know, this organization sees, understands like really what their community members are needing to know, um, you know, basic skills, being able to communicate uh, with their children's schools. And, and then the, in this case, it was a public library kind of doing a training on how to uh, teach technology and then um, they kind of do it as a partnership. And so then the local community organization is able, in this case, actually do the class in a uh, local language, uh, in the community's language and, and be able to contextualize it. So I think that's, um, you know, it's another example of, you know, how working together in different types of organizations and institutions working together can really um, make a big impact. So I love that a lot. The idea of using the existing expertise and value in an organization, uh, and some may have expertise that others don't have, and getting them to pair that up, that's fabulous. We have a question already in the Q&A, which I should have reminded everybody at the beginning, if you have questions, put them in the Q&A. Uh, so a question uh, in the Q&A goes to Dan, but I think uh, John or Stacy might actually have uh, thoughts on this also. Personal privacy. So Dan, when you're gathering that information about those that you serve, how are you protecting their privacy? One of the things we did in terms of uh, researching systems was to ensure that all of the data we collect is encrypted. So this is what's nice is that we use, um, <clears throat> again, I, I'm not the designer of this, but the, it's Salesforce with a, something called form assembly, which is, again, it's all coded and such. So it's got a high level encryption that's actually, a, I, from what I understand, is on par, if not better than like what Google offers. Uh, so that's in terms of that collection of data. The other part I want to emphasize too is that we spend a good chunk of time in our, or many of our courses spend a good chunk of time talking about privacy issues. Uh, something we've done and I would encourage <clears throat> lots of places to do is we've partnered with a, a internet security company to actually help us develop tutorials for our learners because like I can tell you all about privacy, but these are the people who see on the, you know, these are the security people who see all the threats firsthand, who they're targeted at, what populations they're going after. So we, we, they came to us, we, you know, we had conversations and like, what can we do for you? And it was like, well, you guys see on the back end what these threats are. Tell us how to teach the people that we're working with what to be aware of or the process of doing that too, which again is, is about privacy as well. Uh, yeah. So I have to ask, when will those be out, Dan? Uh, <laughs> soon, soon. Uh, that soon. that process is ongoing now. Uh, we've been talking with this. The company is called NetScout. They're a pretty great organization. Okay. They're international, but they're they're actually based in Boston, and uh, they've got a team of about thirty people that are working on them for us uh, right now. Uh, I'm hoping by the end of the year we'll have them and. We share, as, as you know, Angela, everything that we put up is free and open on our site, so anyone can go grab it. Okay, awesome, thank you. Stacy. you also gather information directly from folks. Yeah. How do you, how do you maintain privacy? Yeah, so um, 
I, you know, it's great to hear kind of what Dan is doing. So, you know, I've, I um, have a library a degree. And so I definitely, you know, come from this background of just, you know, only collect what you need to collect um, for, you know, because if you don't, if you don't have the data, then um, you don't have to worry about um, keeping it safe in private. Um, and so, of course, that's really important. And, um, and, you know, there's, I think, you know, especially if you're collecting data, uh, a lot of data on participants, you know, kind of Dan's approach, what he talked about is really good, you know, go with somebody with the expertise that um, can, you know, really uh, kind of protect, you know, do the right approach there. Um, I think though also, and I, it's again, great to hear Dan talk about what their, their approach to teaching about privacy and security in their classes, because that's something that unfortunately does get overlooked a lot um, in um, digital literacy classes. Uh, there is, I can share the link. There's a paper that um, did a big investigation and it sh they found that there was, the topic actually got kind of missed a lot in a lot of community-based and library classes. This is from a couple of years ago. Um, and in that too, and that a lot of the, and that the people too that are um, digital inclusion organizations serve also just have a lot more kind of pr uh, different types of privacy and security risks than maybe a lot of, than other people do. Um, so like, for example, like I have um, private device right here, like this is mine, except for my kids fiddling around with it. Like I don't have to really worry about, um, you know, who else is there, but a lot of people share devices. Um, and so they get like even a phone, like, you know, it's not really necessarily their phone. And so there's a really different approach to thinking about kind of how somebody's kind of personal information can, and how to actually kind of use devices, right? And you talk about like, don't share your password, but you know, in practicality, like what are kind of actionable things that people can do um, and then back when we're also in this an era where we're going back and using public internet again, you know, people are using the internet in public places and there's different types of privacy and security risks. Um, if you're using primarily, um, you're accessing the internet primarily in those types of places too. That's super helpful, thank you. Okay, we're gonna jump into myths now. Tech Goes Home created this fabulous page on uh, myths, digital equity myths, and we will share that link. Dan, tell us why you created the page and how you determined what went on the page. Yeah, so I can't take credit for this. This is like John and Stacy and their colleagues who do all the hard work when it comes to all these studies and incredible information. Our issue was, and we were hearing this from uh, uh, individuals who are funders of ours, so influencers, if you will, that there's there was so much and so what we, we we sat down at a conversation with one of them and they and in that conversation he he said something that um a lot of people think it's like well isn't it true that just everyone has a computer and it just it dawned on us it's just like oh there are three main myths that we we deal with when it comes to digital inclusion everyone's got a computer everyone's got internet access and everyone knows how to use it. I mean, John mentioned this very specifically in the, in the beginning. So it just, it just hit us as a group. It's like, why don't we basically take all this incredible research that's being done and group it into those three categories that are bite-sized and understandable by people who are outside of our bubble, our digital inclusion bubble, where we all know these things. So we did that. Um, we've always thought kind of um, our work is related to three main issues. It's, it's workforce development, it's academic achievement, and, and, um, and health. So we, you'll see on that page, like a number of um, the research pieces, you know, fall into those categories. But that's how that came to be. Uh, and if people, if they're looking at that and they have suggestions for it, I mean, please email us and let us know. Uh, um, we're not the experts when it comes to the, the research. So we, we'd love to get more up there. But we wanted to make it accessible for people outside of our, our bubble. I often recognize the bubble that I'm in. I feel like I, I, I need to be constantly, my neighborhood's a bubble, right? My, um, my the world that I, I'm talking to folks like you, all you guys all day, right? Like that's my professional bubble. Uh, so I, there, we've always struggled with the, everybody has a mobile phone type of type of myth and I feel recently I kind of got lulled into this false sense of having gotten past that because and I think there, the that that um that that occurred because there was so much talk about getting students devices 
but we we were still not talking about adults needing to have the right device. Um, so, John, tell us what the data says. Who relies upon a mobile phone compared to a mobile phone and a computer? Short answer is poor people rely solely on the smartphone to a degree that is much higher than um, for upper income people. And I've actually been looking, um, and so the research is pretty clear about that, not just that low income households are more likely to be cell phone only or smartphone only, but then when you take it the next step and ask people um, how they accomplish things online or what things they do online, if you compare smartphone only respondents to respondents with uh, a computer and a household a broadband connection, uh, that's wireline, the incidence of internet usage is much higher for those folks with a computer and a wireline broadband connection. So the uh, research is, is pretty compelling. I also look at internet adoption rates across cities, and there's a striking correlation between cities with high levels of poverty and high levels of residential segregation and incidents of smartphone only and the negative correlation with uh, subscriptions to wireline broadband in those cities um, with high poverty rates and high levels of residential segregation. So smartphone only is a measure of inequality, digital inequality. Thank you, John. There is, there is a use for a smartphone, of course, we all have uses for our smartphone. Uh, Dan, when we were prepping for this, you described specifically how you all make use of the smartphone. Tell us what you do. Yeah, so when COVID hit, we, as some of you might know, our, our courses have all been in person for the length of our um, existence. And COVID hit, so obviously everything had to switch to uh, distance learning at home. Uh, the problem, of course, is that you can't take a digital uh, inclusion course if you don't have a computer or internet at home. And often to get that computer or internet, you have to do something online. For example, if you want Comcast Internet Essentials, uh, you can call the number, but you know maybe it's busy or the, at least at the beginning of COVID, the wait times were incredible. So using a phone is important. So what we do <clears throat> is when a, one of our instructors signs people up to take a, a Techos Home course, uh, they'll call them all. Uh, first ahead of time because before it was in person and then they'll actually walk them through on their phone how to do certain things and we've created some video tutorials specifically for how do I sign up for internet essentials say on my phone as opposed to using a computer because we want them to be able to do it before the computer arrives because we ship everyone a machine but we want the internet to get up and going and just an ex I just want to give an example of this smartphone. I, I know we, we're probably preaching the choir here, but there might be some that aren't aware. Smartphones are amazing, but like my, so my kids are, you know, my nine-year-old goes to fourth grade and every morning I have to fill out a form and I'm going to pull it up. I get, a, I get a text message from the school system, which is great. And I click on the link, but this is what I see. I don't know if you can even read that. But this is a non-mobile enabled page where I have to fill out medical information every morning for my every single morning for my child. And it's just like, I can do it because I can zoom in, I can do blah, blah, all these crazy things. But again, if I'm a new user or I, you know, it's just, just a simple form so my kid can go to school uh, is hard to do. And that's just one of a thousand examples of why a smartphone is great to have, but it certainly doesn't replace having that computer and the internet and the skills to use at home. Perfect example. Thank you, Dan. Stacy, tell us your story about mobile phones as a starting place in the digital literacy continuum. Uh, yes, happy to. Uh, so I think that, um, you know, as we're talking, you know, I think that it's yes, like as everyone's mentioned, it's important to recognize kind of where the kind of the benefits of, of smart of having smartphone and different types of internet access and different types of um, experiences and especially for when um, thinking about teaching um, digital literacy and recognizing that a lot of you know we know that a lot of people um, do have smartphones and or have at least experience using them maybe even if they're not um, 
connected to like actually connected to a data plan, but they've used it before, right? So it's a starting place for some familiarity. So as an example, um, in some research that I'm doing right now, I've been talking to um, some organizations that are kind of um, using those phone skills as stepping stone to um, developing com more computer-based skills. Um, and, and so, you know, I think any, you know, anybody that's here that's ever tried to teach somebody how to attach uh, something to an email knows that it's actually, you know, it's, it's kind of a very complicated process the first time you've ever done it and trying to teach somebody. But, um, and so instead of just trying to be like, well, you need to send this as an attachment um, and kind of forcing somebody through that way, then, you know, it's like, okay, well, take a picture using your phone and then text it to me. And so for most people, they have done that before and they can, they can do that and then can use that kind of conceptually as like, okay, you know, when teaching then about attachments. And that kind of extends to as well for whether organizations are actually doing digital literacy training or just trying to help assist people remotely now, instead of trying to force everybody to use Zoom if there are teams, um, if there are um, a more beginner user, having options of like being able to use like WhatsApp or FaceTime um, and other types of methods of of, of, of connecting using again with the the apps and experiences that people are already already familiar with. Great, thank you, Stacy. Okay, another myth: uh, we often hear young people have digital skills. Digital natives. Once all of us old people die off, it's going to be fine because the digital natives will just take over. Uh, we all know this is another myth. Uh, so let's talk about that. Dan, explain this myth to us. I mean, I, I, the data is, is shocking on this. It's something like, I, 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 I shouldn't be the one quoting data on this panel, but it's something like one out of four young people either have very low or no digital skills. It's something crazy like that, like 25%, like 10% have no skills. And I think uh, we see it all the time, uh, especially with some of our um, uh, late high school learners who are trying to go into college, whatever, whatever or a young career. And, uh, you know, they'll, we, we did this poll once where we asked a group of them, like a large group of people, do you use the internet often? And something like 70% of them said yes. And then it was like, well, do you use social media often? And 90% said yes. And it was just like, didn't realize that, like, this, that, like you didn't realize that social media was the internet. I mean, it was just, oh, there we go. See, I was, I was close on the data. Wasn't I close? 10, 17, that's 25. I win, right? Um, but it's, uh, yeah, I mean, we're finding that, especially when it comes to workforce development uh, skills, when it comes to how do I find a job? How do I develop that digital resume? How do I, you know, some of those soft skills, like how do I do the uh, interview on Zoom that we're all having to deal with now? I mean, those are some of the skills we're, that we're being requested to teach from our partners on the ground uh, for people who are in their teens and 20s. I mean, that, that have grown up with this, that are a digital native. Uh, they might have great digital tunnel vision like, you know, that they, they know what they know, uh, but when you try to get outside of that, uh, in some ways, they're, they're no different than the grandmother who's never used email before. The one that seems to be coming up often is the uh, typing skills. So, seems so simple, but if you're always like this, how would you know how to do this, right? Um, I, my youngest is 10, and I have been encouraging her lately use all the fingers <laughs> um, because of we, it's so easy to get into the habit of not using all your fingers. All right, let's get into another myth. Uh, another myth that we hear often is the digital divide is a rural problem. John, why is that not true? One of my favorite myths to debunk is this one. Um, and for a little context, the current FCC tends to define addressing the digital divide as addressing network deployment gaps in rural America. And so that's defining the digital divide in one very specific way, which is about network deployment. And it's true that networks in rural America are not as fast or as available as in other parts of the country. However, a very important part of the digital divide 
a larger part of the digital divide is the adoption gap, that 20 percentage point gap that I mentioned at the outset. And those are the millions of U.S. households who do not subscribe to a wireline broadband internet plan, so they can't do school online, they can't do job training online, all those things. And the digital divide in urban America is larger than the digital divide in rural America when you start to focus on the adoption gaps. Part of that's because there are more people in urban America than in rural America, but it does underscore the fact that in urban parts of this country, particularly poor neighborhoods, internet subscription rates are very low, and that adds up to a digital divide that for urban America is larger from an adoption perspective than the entire digital divide for rural America. So one piece of the, uh, well, there's multiple reasons for this lack of adoption, right? So uh, let's get into that a little bit, John. In urban and rural areas, why, when the infrastructure is available, no matter where they live, why are folks not subscribing to the service? The leading, reading, uh, the leading reason that people uh, cite when asked why don't you subscribe to broadband at home is cost of the monthly internet service fee. Um, so cost rises to the top, um, cited by about half of all non-broadband adoption. This is according to the 2019 Pew Research Center study. Um, another part of it is computer devices. We talked about the myth that people think everybody has computers. No, they don't, obviously. And it's a barrier to having a connection at home cited by, I think, on the order of 40 percent of, of respondents. Um, after that, um, you do have digital skills and worries about privacy and security looming large. I think an important thing to take away from the barriers discussion is that the reasons for non-adoption are multiple. Uh, oftentimes stakeholders like to think there's one reason and let's find that reason, solve it, and we're done. It's more complex than that. The reasons are multiple. When you're solving the affordability reason uh, as a barrier to adoption for a, a household, um, if you're not at the same time addressing digital skills and literacy issues, you're not really fully addressing the, the problem at hand. So um, affordability is the leading reason, but there's almost invariably multiple reasons for not having broadband at home. Which brings us back to that digital literacy piece. And that in this, in this time right now when we have more and more really well-meaning people and we totally appreciate all of the digital inclusion work going on out there, Digital literacy is the one that seems to be left off, even though it is a significant barrier. Can I, can I add to that also digital redlining? So the fact that in some places the infrastructure is not available where you think it would be available, and the reasons for that have to do with the internet service providers not deploying broadband. Um, John, can you go over like the overlap of poverty and digital redlining and traditional redlining. And uh, I think Paulo is going to share a redlining map for us. Yeah, so part of the issue around redlining and network deployment in urban areas is that in urban areas for wireline, there's generally going to be two options, cable service or digital subscriber line service from the telephone company. Oftentimes, the affordability issue looms pretty significantly for cable service because it's, you know, northward of probably of 70 bucks a month to get online with broadband with cable. That's out of reach for a lot of households. DSL may be there, may be a less expensive alternative, but providers are not investing in their DSL networks. So you get, you know, carriers who have DSL service are all about investing in 5G and things like that these days. So there's not money left over from an investment perspective for them to maintain DSL networks. So then the option becomes a lousy and to many households still expensive DSL service that has really slow speeds that doesn't cut it for online learning and all those things. And so that's um, certainly an inhibition to subscription along with the other reasons that we've been talking about, which is why we see 
people in different communities, different cities around the country trying to kind of patch together some sort of network alternative to address these deficits in low-income neighborhoods with respect to network quality. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, and I think Stacy has a comment on this. Yeah, so um, this, is, this is extremely important and I'm, I'm very thankful for, um, for John and NDIA to kind of um, elevating this issue and um, as some other um, kind of uh, scholars have also recently started kind of um, broadening um, what's kind of underneath this digital redlining umbrella. So somebody, uh, so like uh, Chris Gillard, um, for example, has started to talk about digital redlining as something that encompasses not even just like the the access, like wires in the ground, but also sort of the institutional barriers that have um, prevented people from being able to to get the digital digital literacy skills over time because of you know the you know failures of educational systems or people who um, because internet is too expensive um, that they have to rely on the internet at um, at school and then that internet is filtered um, and so they actually aren't getting able they didn't have an experience of learn you know using the unfiltered kind of real internet so um, they're you know so again, like these um, issues, or, you know, the kind of the wires in the ground, um, kind of also the issues around wires in the ground also relate to the other kind of structural problems that um, that ultimately do impact adoption and literacy too. So that's super fascinating, Stacey. The idea that if we're always used to using a public access computer, like how does that change our relationship with that technology? Uh, I've heard recently some. Um, disparaging remarks on uh, computer, loaning computers, which totally struck me as being accurate because it does change our relationship to it when we can keep using it again and again. We change the settings, right? We understand that we have that power uh, and we understand a lot about it. And I, there's also that paternalistic kind of piece about, well, we can't put it in your home and we can't give it to you for real. We just let you borrow it borrow the internet, borrow the computer. Back to our barriers, <laughs> Dan, uh, not that I ever got off the barriers. Uh, thoughts from you about the, um, the idea of giving away internet for free. Yeah, oh, first, I got a comment on that. So I worked in a middle school and this is going back 15 years ago. One-to-one -one laptop school is the biggest urban one-to-one in New England at the time, we had 650 students, 650 MacBooks, 100 staff, 100 MacBooks. We, we pushed with the students that it was their device, that they owned it. We made them sign a document that they owned it. And, in, and Deb Sosha and I, Deb can talk about this too, because she was the principal at the time. We didn't lose one student machine in four years, not one. Staff machines all the time, because they didn't see them as theirs. It was the school's machine. It wasn't mine. The kids saw them as that was their computer and they damn well took care of it. Uh, on the internet for free thing, so I think John's totally right. Cost is such a huge barrier for people. And even when you get beyond that cost, this is just what we're seeing now, it is still hard to sign people up for internet. And one example we'll use specifically is the immigrant populations that we work with. There is such, and this is, again, I, this is anecdotal. I only have like data on this, but we are hearing from our partner organizations, there is such distrust right now among immigrant populations for anything outside of their community that they will not fill out the Comcast IE form because they're so afraid that ICE will show up at their doorstop because Comcast is then gonna sell that information to the government. So we, it is taking, a Herculean effort of staff time of our staff and our instructors to work with individuals to ensure they have the access they need. Techno's Home pays for a year of internet access for all of the learners that need it. And even with that, we struggle to get people to sign up. Ongoing issues, right? Uh, thank you, Dan. Alrighty, Stacy, in your research with immigrants and refugees, what structural barriers are keeping our new residents from digital equity? 
Um, sure, you know, fortunately, there's a lot, um, but I think <laughs> um, I think what's important to know that maybe not um, not everyone realizes unless you are uh, work with uh, with uh, recent uh, refugees is that you know basically our refugee resettlement structure in the United States is all around employment, which really shouldn't be a surprise um, for anyone that's spent any time with government policy. But um, but that really um, and so basically you come to the U.S and you're expected to get employment in 90 days. Uh, and so, um, so then that, ha you know, and so any organization, um, resettlement agency or other, um, you know, state government that gets, get funding from the federal government around, um, around resettlement kind of it has to be employment focused and so of course that impacts a lot of the type of, um, of training that people are doing and you know just think about like if you know if the goal was just to like you know learn you know learn English and kind of you know sort of um, have time to integrate into your new community and learn like about your new community, the types of like digital literacy classes that you could, you know, an organization could do versus if it's like all like, here's how to apply for a job. Um, but organizations do get um, very, um, very crafty and finding the wiggle room and where they can um, kind of structure programs so they're providing some more support um, and make them more um, and so they're able to, you know, kind of, uh, you know, make a more robust than just simply employment based programs. Um, but the, um, I think it's just, it's it's just there's this this that sort of structure and again like you know then that also has sort of ripple effects right because if you are expected to get a job and you know basically it'll most likely be low wage work um because you know your credentials that you had wherever you were don't probably transfer over and then that just limits your time and ability to be able to do all the other things that you need to do learn english um you know or or just um you know, do some additional schooling and training, you know, working credentials. So, um, and then on top of that, a lot of um, people have families and they're focused on their children and, you know, supporting them. So, um, and then of course, as I mentioned with English and Dan talked a lot this, about this too, is, you know, that um, if, you know, someone's uh, first language isn't English and they're le actively learning English, basically digital technologies are kind of built on, the English language, the internet is 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 in primarily in English, and so that is also just an additional um, something additional that people have to try to figure out how to how to use this um, this technology. And I mean, it's hard enough for people who are you know are have grown up with English their entire lives, to, trying to use trying to figure out how to apply for you know fill out a form to get unemployment insurance. Um, but on top of that, if it's not in the your primary language, it's just one other thing. Stacy, there's a clarifying question. Um, that you're talking about people who mm. come to the US in a traditionally legal way, there might often, because there's so much attention to those who may come in an illegal way that we don't realize there's a good number of folks that, that are supposed to be here. Right. So yeah, there's, so you have, so people who are, um, refugee is, um, and actually like a legal um, definition that um, from the, the U.S. federal government. Um, and then even within there, there's, so, and actually in our, our paper, we use kind of a broader term about forced migration, which, um, which encompasses people who, um, you know, have, uh, you know, official refugee status have, you um, or asylee status or are, are undocumented, um, but the having that if somebody is a um, is a federal is as the federal designation of a refugee, there's different services and programs that are available to them that are. Um, but then that's that's only for a distinct period of time. Um, but then after a certain point, then you know it opens up. So most a lot of things like at public libraries are you know not. Um, and a lot of community organizations don't care about des that designation. It's just that for the certain agencies and certain like kind of government support, only people who um, enter the U.S. with that um, particular status are eligible for certain programs and services. That's super helpful. Thank you. NDIA has had more of those organizations serving refugees coming to us asking for advice because the way that they used to serve them was in person 
And that's hard now. So uh, overall, we're definitely seeing more organizations who didn't do digital inclusion work are kind of being forced to do digital inclusion work during the right. pandemic. And a lot of times they were doing them kind of on the side. We found out there's a lot of like ad hoc, you know, it's just like, you, you know, kind of helping people when you see them like figuring out how to do this and that on their phone and, and going back to the mobile phones. So um, if you, uh, if you uh, if you have a refugee status, then you get a mobile phone on arrival. But mo a lot of what we heard is a lot of people upgrade to a smartphone pretty quickly. Again, they may not have like data service, data plans, but they have they have a they have a smartphone that they're able to use with Wi-Fi when they're able to get it. That's perfect. Thank you. Okay, Dan, we have a question about uh, internet essentials versus hotspots. This is a common question. It's not always internet essentials, right? Not everybody has Comcast in their area, but a wireline solution uh, versus a hotspot solution. Comcast is a, is a, adds to the complexity of it because it is in that $10 range, whereas the other wireline solutions are often more. Dan. Yeah, so we, Boston has Comcast, Verizon is, is a recent player, but um, I think, you know, Comcast, Internet Essentials is the one that's often cited as the, the leader when it comes to the wireline offerings. And then the, the wireline versus hotspot is a really good question and something we spend a lot, we spend a lot of time thinking about the process and how we want to deal with this. So when you, we offer both uh, to people, depending on their situation, again, the the, the hotspots tend to be more expensive, but I, I, it's just, if you can't get IE, you need something. So our process is such that we, we train our instructors to essentially walk our learners through a series of questions to determine which option is best for them. If you live outside of a Comcast area or you can't get it because you don't qualify based on a number of things, or like I mentioned earlier, you're not comfortable <clears throat> providing information to Comcast, we just give you a hotspot instead. What's interesting is we're finding that right now the current demand is about even for both. Um, so, you know, a little more on the hotspot side, but it's, it's really not that much more uh, right now. So uh, we, we try to meet people where they are. And this, this is true whether it's skills training or it's internet access. It's just like, what is the internet access that best suits you in your situation? A good chunk of the people we serve are homeless. Uh, they can't get internet essentials because they don't have a home to install it. So, or a lot of, a lot of people go from couch to couch. Uh, so having a hotspot just is a much better solution for someone in that situation. Dan, what about the cost difference? And not for, well, in, the, in this particular situation, it is the cost difference to tech goes home, right? Because you all have raised the money. And to an individual, sure. So right now, because their Comcast is giving you those first two months free, uh, it's a hundred bucks basically for a year of internet access uh, at your home. Uh, yeah, we go through Mobile Citizen, which uh, most NDI people, NDIA people are, are familiar with. I think right now it's $180 for a year that includes the hotspot plus a year of service. I, I, someone could kick me in the head and tell me that's wrong. I'm, I'm not sure. I think it's about 180 bucks. So the cost, it's, it's like I said, it's more expensive for the hotspot. From our perspective, it, you do what you got to do. From the individual's perspective, that's a tough one though. I mean, tethering on your phone, if you have the smartphone, that can be expensive. I mean, Stacy brought up a really good point. And we saw this, we see this all the time where people have smartphones with zero data plans. Um, so I, I don't know how you would pull that off, but uh, it's, it's tough. I mean, John's point early on is cost is a huge factor. And it's, we find that, 40% of our learners who have internet in a particular time uh, cancel it at some point because it's too expensive. So it, it's, I mean, that's not going to be a surprise to anyone on this panel or anyone listening, you know, when 91% of our learners are considered categorized as very low income and more than half are uh, categorized as extreme low income. It, it's no surprise that something that gets canceled is that 10 to $20 a month bill. Right, exactly. John, one of the questions we have in the chat is a question that has been coming up just all over the place. Uh, is the internet a utility? When you start with that question, at least from the DC policy perspective, you get a lot of static really fast. I mean, the, 
impulse behind that comes from, well, electricity is a utility, water is a utility, and everybody has those. So if broadband were a utility, couldn't we get to that place with, with broadband? Um, when you start to have that discussion, you get a lot of pushback from policy types that say, well, um, the world is a complex place and you can't just give everything away for free. And then you also get um, if we were to make broadband a utility, you're bringing the heavy hand of government regulation into the picture, and that's going to stifle innovation and have all sorts of bad consequences. What is interesting, though, is that there's actually a consensus of where the Internet is a utility. And that consensus evaporates some, at some point outside the parking lot of libraries or schools. So we're okay with uh, libraries shooting their Wi-Fi beams out to provide access and schools doing the same thing. But much beyond that, um, we're not going to go there because that could um, threaten some business models. But you see in communities around the country, uh, some lots of actors starting to try to push those boundaries, um, either through municipally owned fiber projects or on smaller scales, uh, neighborhood wireless projects to um, basically aim free or low cost wireless internet to um, neighborhoods where there's high poverty rates and low adoption levels because of that cost factor. So the discussion is um, taking a few steps in a different direction, but you still get a heck of a lot of pushback from, from policy types when you just use that phrase. Um, maybe a way to think about that, that is not to use the phrase, but take the actions to get more networks to more people by whatever means with whatever resources you can uh, scrap together. I've, I've, I've lately become um, more comfortable with saying that, that we should think of internet as a utility if only to push the conversation, <laughs> right? Like I know legally, chance of that is like so thin. Uh, and I say that to all of my activist friends because those internet service providers are so powerful. Uh, they have a lot of lobbyists. I'm not sure if you've all have noticed, <laughs> um, but they definitely do not want to see it in the utility realm. But us having the conversation about how it is like a utility means that we ha there has to be a middle ground right they're gonna they're gonna have to get regulated maybe not as much as some of us would like them to be regulated but we're gonna have to have that middle ground where there's we know how much people are being charged because really we don't right now that's kind of messed up that we don't have that data uh, and then to to be able to have a subsidy and if we're not forcing them to do it which we're not right now the, the $10 for Comcast and the five or 10 for AT&T's access, it's all voluntary. Uh, charters is with taxes and fees around 20. So those are voluntary offers that we appreciate, but we don't have control over who's eligible. They have total control over who's eligible. So there has to be that middle ground. So Angela, I can, it, maybe my math is wrong, but if you think about it in terms of cost per like unit of speed, why is it so much cheaper as it gets faster? Like, what's up with that? Like, no, it's like for a hundred bucks, you can get like gigabit speed, but for 10 bucks, you get 25 megs. Like the math in my head says that it's four times cheaper to, to go fast when we all know it, the cost, it, it's the same for the provider. So essentially you're charging more per megabyte to poor people. And it's just, come on, like, at least make it equal. I mean, like, we can't even, never mind, equity versus equality, right? But I don't know, it's just, it's, it's silly to me that if, if you're wealthy, you have fast internet. I mean, look what happened in Flint, right? Where, you know, apparently it was okay to have dirty wire because people were poor. I mean. I don't care what your economic situation is, you should have clean water. And I mean, preaching the choir here, but you should have fast internet too. Well, and then too, we um, have the it, things with the low cost programs, the lower, lower cost programs, um, 
is, you know, dependent and you know, you can't, you can't sign up unless you haven't had service for 60, 90 days. And, you know, we don't do that in, you know, if you're, uh, you know, signing up for like a lower cost, per, you know, get discount on you, your water bill. Like, you know, I'm like, well, have you used our water in the last 60 days? I'm sorry. You know, and, um, and it's just, it's not realistic in the fact that basically most people don't have an option to what kind of internet that they have coming into their house and people's economic uh, changes differently. Uh, I do appreciate, I've seen, you know, it's, it's, I think it's, you know, it's difficult with the kind of the local versus DC kind of uh, push and pull here, but there's been some really great, you know, kind of local efforts. Of course, you know, some uh, municipalities have are you know doing municipal broadband, but there's also a lot of great stuff happening with community networks, and um, that's really exciting and getting a little bit out of my area of expertise. But um, I do actually there was a question about kind of tribal resources, which I don't have too many, but um, I do have um, colleagues that are working with. Um, I think they're. They're, I don't think, think they're working with any um, US-based um, indigenous communities, but they're doing stuff where community networks of actually bringing community networks to um, indigenous communities and actually um, kind of doing this approach of actually making it kind of doing a lot of community-based um, training and actually kind of um, direction. So it's not just if it's like, actually let's help like work and define how this is gonna be built and what is what does a, you know, a network look like to you and what does it mean to that, making sure that it's, um, you know, building upon the, you know, the ways of knowing and um, uh, that, that are already are already here instead of, you know, kind of just coming in and putting down a wire and be like, here you go. So um, there's a, I think there's a lot, I think, of power. I mean, I think it's really important to keep pushing policy, especially like, I don't know elsewhere, but here in Washington State, we've been hearing people say the internet is a utility. And so, um, so it's like, okay, so what? What does that mean then? It's a nice catchphrase, but what are you doing? How are you changing policy to actually make that true? I think that's exactly right, Stacy. that we all feel like it's a utility because we feel like it's essential and we have to use it. The tricky part is what does that really look like? And I, at this moment in time, I feel like the more we can, folks we can involve in figuring out what does that actually look like, the better for all of us. Okay, we have a few minutes um, left. So I forgot to mention at the beginning, we go for an hour. If there's additional questions, we keep going. So if there are additional questions, folks should throw those in the Q&A. Um, regarding the question of tribal resources, uh, anyone else, Stacy has the one, and we will, NDIA staff, We'll pull some of those resources that we usually share, and if we're keep if we're still going, they'll throw it in the chat. If not, as with all of our webinars, we have a uh, PDF of links. So if you go to the recording of the webinar, you also see the link uh, for. I'm not sure if we call it resources or links, but basically, we share so much during these that we want to make sure that none of those links get lost, so they are attached to each of the webinars. Okay, I'm gonna do last call for comments from my amazing panelists. Things that you wanted to make sure that you shared during this webinar that you haven't had a chance to say. Thank you, Angela and the NDI team for continuing to help us break down these silos. I mean, someone used that word earlier. I can't remember who it was, but I mean, it's just, it's hard enough to fight this if you're doing it on your own. So having Angela and her team kind of coordinating this is just, it's fantastic, so thank you. So Dan, there's actually a question I think that is appropriate for you in the chat. Um, are you uh, considering sharing or replicating your business model? This has been a recurring question that Dan gets a lot. Where, where is Tech Goes Home on this question, Dan? Uh, the answer is yes. And uh, let's, um, to be, to be uh, more information coming. That's, that's yeah, true. I mean, I, 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 that's, I, really that's so silly of me to be, to, to be cagey like that. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're definitely looking at expansion at the moment. Uh, it's something that uh, we're seeing the demand is out there. Obviously, COVID has kind of kicked that. I mean, I think you mentioned earlier, Angela, the idea that non-digital uh, training places are 
looking at this. I mean, this is what we've seen. The vast majority of our partners have nothing to do with digital education. Their home shelters, their you know, their churches, their you know, uh, things like that. That community assets that just know these are skills. So that doesn't. That's true everywhere. Uh, we just have to do it in a way that makes sense for us and for organizations. I will say we're closer now to it than we've ever been before. Uh, so we'll hopefully have updates on that soon. Great, thank you. Last comment from John Horgan. I will just summon a phrase from my high school or grade school teacher, which was repetition is the backbone of teaching. And my experience in this arena has been that there's a constant need for re-education and repetition to stakeholders about what the nature of the issues are with respect to digital inclusion. Conflation of network deployment and adoption happens all the time. Um, so I think it's important to focus policymakers and other stakeholders on the ball and not the shiny objects in the corner like 5G or even um, sort of a rabbit hole-ish kind of debate on whether the internet is a utility or not. It's darn important and there are problems to solve and focus on the problems to solve, not the you know, sort of Talmudic discussions about um, 5G or internet as utility. I totally appreciate the comment on repetition. Uh, although I think if I have to explain to yet another person some of the things that we discussed today, <laughs> which you'll notice NDIA staff has grown, that is in part to keep my sanity. <laughs> so I'll let them repeat it. Uh, Stacy, last comments. Um, so yes, just thank you uh, to NDAA and um, to all of everyone out there that's been just doing sort of like superhuman things since um, since well since bef always, but especially since March. Um, it's it's incredible to see what has actually been been deployed and in, in progress since then. Um, and I think the kind of building upon a little bit what John said, I think that you know I think it's there's a I, I really wish that people, there would be a lot more focus and money funding, supporting people, organizations that are fo helping people use device, digital technologies for the first time or actually learning how to use them and the kind of these more beginning levels. Um, you know, that, you know, you know, teaching STEM and is still like, you know, super sexy and important. Um, it will, will, will be, um, but there's a lot of opportunity. There's a lot of organizations out there doing a whole lot in, uh, for, for pennies and, you know, just, just not that much more money of actually reliable uh, funding would do a whole much, uh, bunch and help a lot of people. That is a perfect ending plug. Thank you. Big thanks to my rock star panelists. Uh, big thanks to NDIA staff for putting all those great links and graphics up. Uh, and this will be posted within 24 hours. Uh, everyone have a great day.